is a lot of information. Um, and uh, it needs to build because, you know, we're talking about some of the most complex issues in science and in the world. Um, I can assure you that everything that I'm going to say is very well referenced in the scientific literature. I'll try not to bog down this lecture with too much dry material, but if you want that dry material, we can supply it to you. These are some of the textbooks that I've written or co-written. Um, the book up there, Neurobehavioral Disorders of Childhood, uh, came out in 2004. It's used in a number of different medical schools, psychology program, graduate university programs around the world. As you can see in the middle, it's been translated into Korean and now Chinese. Um, there are other textbooks that I've written chapters in, and again, we can get you some of those references. I've been responsible myself for about 25 scientific papers in the last four or five years. Um, I head up a research lab in New York and in Israel, and um, we're doing some cutting edge research into an area called functional neurology, which is a new emerging area of science, which is really what most of everything I'm going to talk about is based on. We've published in some of the top journals in the world. Our lab has published about 60 or 70 papers. We just submitted two papers um, to the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disability, and they've asked us if they can consider it for an upcoming edition that they have specialized in what they call the psychophysiology of autism, which is really a lot of what I want to discuss tonight, not just autism, but uh, other disabilities. I'm also the co-editor-in-chief of a scientific journal, so again, I'm very familiar with research and what that means. This is the book that Betsy was talking about, Disconnected Kids, and if I go too fast tonight or you get a little lost, uh, this is probably the best resource to read, which will go through most of what I'm going through tonight and give you ways that you can go home and kind of assess your own children and see if this actually fits. It has also been translated into Chinese. It's uh, currently also been translated into Korean. This is the second book, which was a follow-up to that book called Reconnected Kids, which came out in 2011. And this book, basically the first book is about what's going on in the brain and what you can do about it. The second book is about when you're changing the child's brain for the better, sometimes it doesn't always look for the better. Um, sometimes their behavior may change dramatically and uh, they can turn into little monsters for a period of time. And so this book is about explaining why that happens uh, based on the neurology of the brain and research and what's going on, but also gives you ways of actually tracking it because I put all of the different milestones in social and emotional areas, cognitive areas, and physical areas so you can compare that and actually see where your child fits from a maturity level in those three major areas. But once you understand it, it doesn't mean it makes it any easy for you at home. So the second part of the book is, what do you do about it? How do you handle these behaviors? So that's, uh, that's what we call the Brain Balance Empowerment Program. So that's what this book is about. Third book I have with Penguin um, coming out in January is something that's getting a lot of excitement at this point. Uh, this is the book. This is the title. Essentially, it kind of is the prequel to everything, which is um, how do you potentially uh, prevent autism before it even happens, preconception. Um, this is where the emerging science is coming. Um, autism is essentially, as shown in the book, an environmental disorder, and ultimately the cure is prevention. So this is where this book is, and you're probably hearing a lot about this next year because it's uh, getting a lot of attention now. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is part of what I discuss in the first chapter of that book, which is um, the epidemic that we're seeing right now. Some people will argue whether it actually is an epidemic or not, um, but what we see are huge increases in numbers of children with what we call neurobehavioral disorders of all kinds, uh, ADHD, OCD, Tourette's, dyslexia, learning disabilities, processing disorders, uh, autism, Asperger's, uh, PDD, oppositional defiant disorder. All of those disorders are increasing at about the same rate and increasing uh, at a significant level. Uh, to give you an idea, autism roughly two to three decades ago was diagnosed one in 10,000 children in the United States. Last year the CDC came out with statistics showing that it is now one in 88 or one in 54 boys. And as I said, this is something that doesn't just affect also just the United States. This is a worldwide issue going on. Um, we know that the UK, Cambridge, came out with statistics about 
three or four years ago showing that it was one in 54 in the UK. And what we see also is in 2011, one of the most startling statistics that we saw came out in May where in South Korea, they published statistics showing that it was one in 38 or one in 20 boys. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that you know, there's a, such a, a, a greater amount of kids in South Korea? Uh, probably not. What it means is that they did a better study than everybody else. They did what's called a population-based study, where they really, instead of doing surveys and looking at records, what they did was they actually went into the schools and counted the bodies of kids that had autism. And um, so the CDC was asked after this study came out, what would happen if we did a population-based study in the United States? They said our statistics would probably be the same or maybe worse. So what we're looking at is, is huge numbers and huge increases in the numbers. And nobody argues that that is the case. Nobody argues that there's been an increase in what we call prevalence or the numbers of people that actually have a diagnosis. Uh, ADHD has increased 2,000% in the past 25 years. All of the other disorders have increased at about the same level. So what we do see some people arguing is over what we call incidence, which means some people argue whether there's actually an increase in new cases or whether we're just recognizing what's always been there all along. Um, and so that was actually, again, like I said, the first thing I looked at in my uh, textbook. And I really spent a lot of time, I ended up speaking up to, to some of the top scientists or what we call epidemiologists in the world that look at this stuff. And although, you know, the answer isn't 100% clear. Uh, what we see is that of that increase, where we go from 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 88, um, with all the people I talked to and all the data that we, we examined, um, this article being an example of that, this was a study that was done in California and published, uh, a study was done by the Mind Institute and published in a journal of epidemiology in January of 2009. Um, what they actually did was look at, in California, there's been an increase of about seven or eight hundred percent over the past 16 years in the diagnosis of autism. So they wanted to know why. Was it because they're recognizing it earlier, doctors are more familiar with it, schools are doing a better job of recognizing it, or was it that we changed diagnostic criteria and made it more inclusive ten years or so ago? Was it because of what we call diagnostic substitution? children that used to be previously diagnosed with another diagnosis like fragile X or mental retardation or that also have that diagnosis uh, are now labeled with autism as well or instead of um, or was it that people were actually moving to California because it provides better services so they looked at all of those factors it was one of the most extensive studies done and they could only account for about 300 percent of the increase maybe 400% of the increase, which means that roughly 40% of the increase they could attribute to all those other factors, but 50 to 60% of the increase they could not explain, which means that these represent new cases that didn't exist before. So when we see new, cr new cases increasing, um, then we, we look at that and can say that that increase would represent an epidemic rise at this point in time. Now, some people argue that epidemic, the term can only be used for infectious disease, but we've used it in the CDC, has used it for obesity or other things. Um, to give you an idea of, of uh, numbers for epidemics, the polio epidemic was declared an epidemic when it was one in 2,700 children, and we're one in 88. So because of all this confusion, we still see that the government hasn't come out or, you know, even mainstream medicine hasn't come out or uh, any other organization and said, okay, we are in fact facing the epidemic, but we are. That's what we're facing at this point. There's no doubt of that, about that. It's increasing at a level that many people say it's the largest epidemic in the history of the world involving children. And the fact that we're not shouting it from the rooftops is kind of amazing. Um.